What a blessing again to come together to praise our God, to worship Him, to lift up His name on high, and to rejoice in all of the gifts and blessings and benefits of grace that we have 
in Jesus Christ. Grace and mercy and peace our Savior has brought to us through His cross, and it is our privilege to call upon His holy name and to be lifted up in the Spirit of our God. We welcome all of those who are visiting with us, and we pray as well for those who are visiting us online, on live stream. We're glad that you've joined us as well, and that we can worship our God together in spirit and in truth. God calls us to worship this morning from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, praise be to Your holy name. May Your Holy Spirit rest upon us and in our hearts to strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ, to bring forth praise and honor and glory to Jesus our Savior, and fill our lives with all of the benefits of Christ and Him crucified, our Savior in love given up for us and for our salvation. And let Christ continue to work in us to bring to completion the work that He has begun in us. Thank You for this Lord's Day. Thank You for the privilege of worshiping You. And we pray that You will be with us today and let this be a joyful day of rest. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in the Trinity Psalter hymnal to 100A. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, and we'll sing from that call to worship of Psalm 100. Let's stand together to sing both stanzas of 100A. Beloved congregation, in whom is your help? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive God's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, we have the reading of God's law. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And as a summary of the law from the book of Romans, chapter 13, Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Let's respond to the hearing of God's law by turning to number 95 in the Blue Psalter hymnal, Gracious God, my heart renew. And let's remain seated to sing all the stanzas of number 95.
Romans chapter 3, this word of assurance and pardon that our righteousness is found not in ourselves and not from the law, but the law reveals the righteousness that we need before God, and it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ Himself. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet by grace, through God's gift of His Son, we are justified. Not by our righteousness, but by Christ's righteousness. Not by our merits, but His. Not by our law-keeping, but by His law-keeping. We cannot keep the law. The law reveals our sin to us and points us to a Savior. A Savior given for the fullness of salvation, for everything that we need to be right with God. Jesus has done it for us. And so we rejoice and give thanks to Him for this unspeakable gift. As people redeemed by grace and saved in the righteousness and blood of Jesus Christ, we are then called to live for Him. And let's sing of that from the Blue Psalter hymnal number 1, that man is blessed, singing from Psalm 1, what we're called to be as people who meditate upon the law, and who strive to follow in God's ways. Let's stand together to sing all the stanzas of number one. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we seek the wisdom and insight of your Holy Spirit so that this word would be a fragrant offering to us. It would be the aroma of life unto life. You've saved us so graciously and powerfully in your own dear Son and have given us the riches of being united to Him and united to His body, the church. Being blessed in union and fellowship 
in unity of mind and heart there. Because you've granted all of us, your people, the same gift of faith. The same faith that clings to the same Savior. The same faith that was brought about by the same Spirit of our ascended Lord and Savior. So in that unity, we hope, Father, to live and to walk, to worship and to fellowship together in this life. Be with us. We recognize this is the life that you've saved us for. Make us more and more worthy of that precious life that you've given. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to Psalm 1. We've just sung a versification of this psalm. But as you know, the blessings that are promised here are upon the one who is saved in Christ and the one who in the grace of Christ and the Spirit of Christ strives to live obediently before the Lord. Psalm 1 is first of all about Jesus. He is the man who is called blessed, who does all of these things that are described in the psalm, who keeps himself away from wickedness and sin. Jesus has no sin. And so in Christ, we find ourselves in this psalm as his people. And we're going to be looking at Philippians 1, a few verses there this morning, and some of the ways that that new life in Christ gets worked out. We're dealing with regeneration and the canons of Dort. What does that new life look like? We're going to look at some of those things this morning. So first, Psalm 1, and then we'll turn to Philippians chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And then to Philippians chapter 1. We're looking at verses 27 through 30. Philippians 1, beginning at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And so far the reading of God's holy and sacred word. Let's turn to the Canons of Dort in the back of the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Page 909, and we're looking at Article 16 of the Third and Fourth Heads of Doctrine, and the effect of regeneration. So we've looked at the gift of faith, we've looked at regeneration, we've looked at the Spirit using means for our conversion, and now we consider in this article some of the effects of that regeneration or that new life that the Spirit has put in us. And let's read this together. Article 16, concerning regeneration's effect. However, just as by the fall, man did not cease to be man, endowed with intellect and will, and just as sin 
which has spread through the whole human race, did not abolish the nature of the human race, but distorted and spiritually killed it, so also this divine grace of regeneration does not act in people as if they were blocks and stones, nor does it abolish the will and its properties or coerce a reluctant will by force, but spiritually revives, heals, reforms, and, in a manner at once pleasing and powerful, bends it back. As a result, a ready and sincere obedience of the Spirit now begins to prevail, where before the rebellion and resistance of the flesh were completely dominant. It is in this that the true and spiritual restoration and freedom of our will consists. Thus, if the marvelous maker of every good thing were not dealing with us, man would have no hope of getting up from his fall by his free choice, by which he plunged himself into ruin when still standing upright. And so far, our confession. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we all generally know what it means to be a good citizen. If I would ask you, what do you think a good citizen is, you'd have something to say. A good citizen is somebody who is neighborly. A good citizen is someone who cares about the people in the community. A good citizen is somebody who votes and pays taxes and pays attention to what's going on in the nation or in the community. A good citizen doesn't spit on the sidewalk. A good citizen keeps his or her grass mowed clean and property kept up. A good citizen picks up litter and trash in the park. And you do those things as a good citizen, not because it's the outward things that make you a good citizen, but the heart of a good citizen is somebody who truly loves the place where you live. You're invested there. You're committed in the place where you live. You look around in your community and you say, this is my community. This isn't just the community or a community. This is my community. This is my home too. And it's everybody else's that lives here as well. That's commitment. That's devotion. That's appreciating and, and, and seeing the value of the place where you live. Paul talks about being a good Christian citizen or a good citizen of the Gospel in these verses. And that means something too. What's a good citizen of the Gospel? We're going to look at how he fleshes those things out, but you might have some things in mind already. Maybe you think, well, someone who loves other people or someone who shows mercy and kindness. A good citizen of the Gospel means you come and you worship. You read the Bible. You pray to the Lord. A good citizen of the Gospel means you love the brothers and the sisters. And you like to study the Bible together with them. You like to help each other. You rejoice with those who rejoice. And you also come alongside those who are weeping. And you weep with them. You feel each other's burdens. And you share in each other's joy. But that too, our good citizenship of the Gospel is not just about the outward things that we do, but there's a heart to it. There's a grounding in it, an inner thing. And Paul has already talked about what some of those things are in this book. We didn't read these verses, but if you flip back, if you have your Bibles open still, go back to 1 verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the heart of a good citizen of the Gospel? Somebody who's been changed by the grace and peace of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody who's been saved by Christ and Him crucified. Somebody whose sins have been covered in the atoning blood of Jesus. Someone who knows peace with God because of the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. A Christian who knows 
because of what Jesus has done, I am right with God. Or, going a little bit further ahead from 1 verse 2, look at 1 verse 9. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. What is a good citizen of the Gospel? One whose love abounds more and more. For God, first and foremost, that's the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But also the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. May your love continue to abound to God and to others. That would make you a good citizen of the Gospel. And then verse 21. And this may be one of the most well-known verses to us in the first chapter. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. A good citizen of the Gospel is one who finds his or her life in Christ. Not in the things of this world. Not in ourselves. Not in other people. Not in possessions. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because to shut off all of this old self and old life Regeneration will have its full effect then when we are in glory with Jesus. Those are some things that Paul has already talked about in terms of the giftedness of this citizenship. And there's a reason why he uses this phrase. He doesn't use this in his other letters. There's some background to it. The city of Philippi was a prominent city in the Roman Empire. Most of the cities that letters are written to or where churches were, were prominent cities. But Philippi has some very remarkable qualities about it. It was the first city to build a temple dedicated to the Roman emperor. So Roman emperor worship went along with that. But related to that, the Roman Empire bestowed upon every citizen in the city of Philippi Roman citizenship. Now that might not sound like a lot to you, because your citizens were you're born and you become a citizen. That's all that it requires. Where you're born is where you become a citizen. But it wasn't that way in the Roman Empire. You either had to be born to a Roman citizen, like Paul was, or you had to buy it. Remember when Paul's in front of the proconsul and he's punishing him and he says, Is this how you treat a Roman citizen? And he says, you're a citizen of Rome? I had to get mine at a high price. Everyone in Philippi was bestowed the gift, the privilege, the honor, the prestige of being a Roman citizen. So Paul uses this language. You understand, you Philippians, what a privilege you have of being Roman citizenship, of having Roman citizenship. Now, understand that in relation to the gospel. You are citizens of the gospel. And Article 16 continues to talk about the giftedness of the working of God as well in spiritually reviving, healing, and reforming, or bending our wills back, making us worthy or worthy citizens of the gospel. We want to consider two things of this citizenship. First of all, a togetherness in the gospel, and then secondly, two gifts of the gospel. In verses 27 and 28, we have this togetherness of the Gospel. We are together in the Gospel. And we're not together robotically, not like blocks and stones. We're not together in the Gospel out of mere human tradition, because that's just the way it's always been. Nope, that's not it. We're not citizens together of the Gospel simply because that's where our loyalties are. We have these human loyalties. It's not for any earthly reasons at all, but it's because of faith in grace and peace in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's where our togetherness begins. Jesus has brought all of us here. Jesus has brought all of us together in Himself in grace and peace and begun that new life in us by His Holy Spirit. So we are together. And this togetherness has a lot of different aspects to it in these verses. First of all, integrity. Our togetherness has integrity. Paul says, whether I am there, whether I come to you, or whether I am absent. So if you look at verse 27, whether I come and see you or, an absent, or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. Do you only work hard when the boss is watching you? 
Do you only obey the speed limit when you see the sheriff just a little ways down, sitting by the roadside? Do you only do things in the right way because you're afraid of the consequences of doing it wrong? In other words, what motivates you? Integrity tells us you don't need an outside motivator. Are you Philippians going to continue to pursue this togetherness in the Gospel whether I'm, I, Paul, am there or not? Whether there's someone watching over your shoulder or whether there isn't. Or I'll ask you a similar question as people of God, members of Redeemer. Do you only come together in the Gospel because of or when the elders and the minister tell you to? Now, I know that you don't, and I commend you in that. You are to be commended in this, in this kind of integrity. Because it doesn't take for you, it doesn't take the elders or the minister or the deacons or anybody else to tell you, be together in the gospel. Help each other, serve each other, be there for each other, comfort each other, pray for each other. You don't need us to tell you that. You know it, and you do it. And that's why you are to be commended. That is evidence of the Holy Spirit working this revival, this reform, this new life in you that you do this with each other without having to be told. And I continue to be astounded, impressed, joyful to hear more and more of these things that happen that the rest of us just don't even know about. People of God taking their gifts that God has given them and blessing somebody else with them. We should rejoice in this, this integrity of this togetherness. This togetherness is a standing together in one spirit. Go back again to chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Together in one spirit. Together in truth. Together in doctrine. Together in understanding. Together in your commitment of the grace of Jesus Christ and the good news that He has brought. That is part of our togetherness, to stand in that one spirit. Now, the church is always in danger of being torn apart by different kinds of dissensions. You go to the letter of 1 Corinthians, and there's a party spirit. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Simon or Peter. I'm of Jesus, says another group. So you've got these four factions. But in the church, we're to be of one spirit. We're to be of the truth. Now, how we work all of those things out and apply that to our lives is always different, and there's still questions of wisdom. Something that all of this COVID-19 stuff has shown me, and maybe it's shown you as well, is that there's a variety of opinions. Even among Christians, even within our own church, there's a variety of opinions on what it is and how to respond and how to deal with this and how to live now and, and, and what is okay and what is not okay and where our consciences are can all be in different places. That's not a bad thing. That's something for us to be patient with. It's something for us to be considerate about and charitable about and kind with each other about because we don't all agree on this. But we do agree on the fundamentals. We do agree on the clear teachings of Scripture. We do agree in the Gospel. Now, if there's a chapter and verse in the Bible somewhere that tells us exactly what to do with something like a virus pandemic, there isn't, but if there were then we would agree on that too. I'm, I have no doubt about that. But there isn't. So we're all striving together in our conscience, right? Romans 14, we should be rested in our own minds about these kinds of things. These are matters of conscience. But when it comes down to the fundamentals, to doctrine, to truth, to the non-negotiable things, we're there. We're there by God's grace. Or think of Paul's analogy in 1 Corinthians 12 as sort of another aspect of this. The parts of the body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. See, you can imagine how some of that could go, right? The hand looks at the eye. That's weird, right? The hand looks at the eye. 
and says, I, you don't do anything. You just sit there. You sit there and you watch and you observe and you just receive stuff. But you don't do anything. You're just there. You kind of move around a little bit and you observe stuff. But I'm a hand. Hands do stuff. Hands make things happen. Hands are active. Hands are powerful. Hands make change. So I don't think I need the eye. Let's have more hands. It's one of the things that really kind of bugs me about that phrase, be the hands and feet of Jesus. As if the rest of the body doesn't count. Or those are the only important ones, and those are the only ones that make change. Well, try something at home today, boys and girls. Close your eyes, and then have somebody put an object in front of you while you're sitting there at the table, and then reach out for it and grab it with your hand, without the use of your eyes. How does that work? It's not going to happen. We need each other in the body of Christ. We've been given each other in the body of Christ. That's the point of that chapter. And that's the point of this here too. We're together. We're together in the truth, working out the truth for the good of one another to bless each other. And we're doing it together in one spirit. And that's part of the new life in Christ. A new will, a new mind. We're not blocks and stones. So we're not doing this by force or or coercion. God's not forcing you to do this. I'm not forcing you to do this. The elders aren't forcing you to do this. You're doing this. You're living out this Christian citizenship because the Spirit has given you this new life. This regeneration. Canons 3, 4, 16. As a result, a ready and sincere obedience of the Spirit now begins to prevail. It's the work of grace. And I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again. It is so wonderful to see the like-mindedness of our church, to come together and share in that like-mindedness. For God's glory, to bear witness of Jesus Christ, but also for the sake of each other. This togetherness also strives together for the faith. We praise God for the unity that we have in Jesus Christ, but we take notice, as the Philippians did as well, We're all recipients of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, but that also means we have a common enemy or common enemies. The world, the devil, and our own sinful flesh as the catechism would sum it up for us. But that means we're not each other's enemies. We're not fighting against each other. But what does our text say? That we're striving together or side by side in verse 27. We strive side by side for the faith of the Gospel. We take the Word of God that we've understood and that like-mindedness that God has given us and we fight against those common enemies together. We oppose those common enemies together. We fight sin. We stand against the world. We stand against the devil. We pray, remove his temptations from us. Keep us from evil. We pray those things for each other. We fight together. We fight side by side. And we do that in a fearless way. Verse 28, not frightened in anything by your opponents. The devil can be very frightening. Our own sinful hearts can be very frightening. The world can seem very, very intimidating. The devil even came to dissuade Jesus Christ from his work. The world tried to oppose Jesus Christ and fill him with fear. But when the church is attacked or when individual Christians are attacked by the world or the devil, it's a sign to us of true faith, of the reality of our salvation and the reality of Christ and His Word. Why else would our enemies be so persistent? Why else would they rage so infamously? If you and I are not a threat to the kingdom of darkness, then why doesn't the devil just leave us alone? Why doesn't the world then leave us alone? They can't leave us alone because we are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. The life that Christ has put in you is a testament to that threat that you have become. You're a child of the light now, not of the darkness. The Philippians were all Roman citizens, but now they've become citizens of a greater kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that is to come in fullness and in power until all of the kingdoms become the kingdom of Christ. That's what's promised in Revelation. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. But until then, you and I and all believers in all the world 
are a threat to that kingdom of darkness. How dare these Philippians say that citizenship of the Gospel is a greater citizenship than the highest honor of being Roman citizens. It's a wonderful illustration of exactly what happens when people who are dead in sins and trespasses are made alive in Jesus Christ. The world looks at us and says, what makes you so special? Why do you think you're going to have it better over there with Jesus and all those Christians in the church? Look at all we've got to offer. Don't you want the prestige and the honor and the the accolades of the world? Don't you want to have a place there, a high, prominent place? What greater honor could you have than to be loved by the world? But therein is the lie. The world doesn't love anybody. And there's no hope there. There's only more darkness. We have been granted this tremendous gift brought out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Not citizens of the world anymore, but citizens of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Praise be to God. That's been given to us. That's been achieved for us at the cross of Christ. So let's have a fearless spirit of power. But how does this give us a clear sign of their destruction? Because that's also in this, in verse 28. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction. And the phrasing in the Greek there is actually this. On the one hand, it's a clear sign to them of their destruction. And on the other hand, it's a sign to you of your salvation. How is this a clear sign of their destruction? Well, in one way, it's a sign of their failure. Every time the world presses on the church, what happens? It gets crushed and defeated, or does it grow? It grows. Every time the world persecutes the church, it grows. Every time the world persecutes a Christian, he or she grows. Because that's the power of grace. That's Jesus working out his promise in what he said. And the world tries so very hard and incessantly, throughout all of history, the world has tried to suppress the church to destroy the church, to snuff out the church, and it never works. So on the one hand, it's their failure. But also, Psalm 2, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The day of judgment is coming. Matthew 21, 44, and the one who falls on this stone, that is Jesus, will be broken in pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. That's a word that Jesus speaks for anybody who doesn't believe in Him. If you don't believe in Jesus, you fall on that stone or the stone falls on you. There's a day of judgment coming. Psalm 1, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We have a togetherness that is based in salvation from God. So let's take up our cross and follow Jesus. Just like Peter was called to do. Just like the disciples were called to do. But just like Peter, we're reluctant to do so. Peter got tested, denied Jesus three times. It took it later for Jesus to restore him three times. Three times, do you love me? And right, before, right after he asked the third time, Jesus, or Peter is dismayed. He's discouraged. And it's not because he's annoyed that Jesus is asking him three times, but it's that point at which it dawns on Peter Well, now I know why you asked me three times, because I denied you three times. I wasn't willing to take up my cross and follow you. Peter sees that. We're reluctant to do it too, because to take up our cross and follow Jesus requires sacrifice. It requires self-denial. It requires putting sin to death, which is hard for us to do. It requires a separation between us and the world, and that's hard for us to do. It requires wisdom. It requires effort and work, and prayer, and seeking the grace of God. But that's what we're called to do. Be together in the Gospel. Secondly, this morning, two gifts of the Gospel. So togetherness in the Gospel, but then two gifts as well. Verses 29 and 30, our last two verses in this section. Paul asserts here once again what we have been looking at. That faith is a gift from Jesus Christ. That which God requires... Okay, boys and girls, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what God requires of you, to believe in Jesus Christ. But that faith that He requires 
is the faith that he also provides. And we've looked at that for several weeks. What God requires, he also provides. That's the way he works in covenant. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And here is the gift of faith worked by the Holy Spirit so that you might believe and be saved. So that you might receive Jesus Christ and all of his saving gifts. So that you might believe the word of truth. So that you might receive that righteousness that is revealed apart from the law. The righteousness of Jesus Christ that justifies. That's a gift. And we've seen that. And I think that one's easy to understand. You notice what he's saying here. It has been granted to you, that's the language of gift, that for the sake of Christ, so where do these gifts come from? They come from or through Jesus. You should not only believe in him. Okay, so there's the gift of faith. But also the second gift, the second thing that's granted that comes through Jesus Christ is suffering. To suffer for his sake. How is suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ a gift? If we are to be Psalm 1 people who don't walk in the way of the wicked, we don't sit in the seat of scoffers, but we meditate on God's law day and night. If we are people of Psalm 1 who in Jesus Christ are called blessed, we have all of these privileges and the gift of faith and we have all of this unity in the church. How is it that to suffer for those things can be considered a gift or something that's granted for the sake of Jesus Christ? That's what's strange about this. Now, first of all, let's ask, what is suffering for Jesus' sake? For you and for me, it might be that you're insulted by somebody else because you believe or because you quote the Bible or because you are trying, striving in the Spirit to obey God's Word and so somebody insults you. Somebody makes fun of you. Somebody calls you a name, a bad name, a derogatory name. Maybe it's that. Maybe some people shun you or ignore you. Well, don't invite so-and-so because they're always trying to do good things. Maybe you're simply just gossiped about, so then you probably don't even know it's happening. But that's still suffering. Maybe it's simply being questioned all the time about why you do what you do. Maybe this happens to you at work. All the time. Why do you do that? Why do you live like that? Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why don't you work? Why won't you come with us to do this on Sunday? Why won't you come and join us in this other thing? Why won't you be more like us? Why are you so different? And maybe it's just constant, a barrage of questions, daily, weekly. And you get tired of that, too. Maybe it's economics. You close up your business on Sunday. Others don't. Maybe there's demand, probably not around here, but in some places there is. There's demand for opening up on Sunday, opening your business. Why can't you come on Sunday afternoon and give me an estimate on this project that I want to do? Why can't your, your shop be open on Sunday? And you say no, because you're committed to obeying God's word. And that might cost you. It might cost you some business. It might cost you some customers. Or farmers, planting season, harvesting season. And the only good day in the week is Sunday. Every other day, it's pouring rain. Do you go out into the field or not? That's the temptation that the devil would lay at your feet. But you're committed to obeying God's word. So you say no, but it costs you. Right? There's a sacrifice in that in obeying the Lord. You suffer for his sake in that way. In many places in the world, of course, this means physical persecution, injustice, hatred, violence, even death. Many of our brothers and sisters today are suffering in ways we cannot imagine because they have a profession of faith in Christ 
and His Word. Or maybe they simply have a Bible in their home. Or they've been spotted with other groups of Christians. Or they've been seen on their way to church. So now back to our question before. How is all of this a gift? Well, there's several ways in which this is a gift and a blessing to us as well. When we suffer for Christ's sake, it strengthens our faith. Just like building muscles. You, you tear them down and you rip them apart as you're lifting heavier weights so that they get built up even stronger. Or in competition. If you want to be the fastest runner at school, then you've got to push harder. So you push harder. Some of this puts pressure on us to push harder. Or maybe it's simply about new information. That might help us in business practices or farming practices. That might help us in parenting or whatever. We get new information and that sheds new light on things. Well, sometimes when we are suffering for Christ's sake, it sheds new light on our situation. And we don't realize the good things that we have had until some of those are taken away. And that brings rejoicing. Maybe it increases our awareness of our own sin and our enemies. Because sometimes we suffer for Christ's sake from places we didn't expect it. Could be friends, could be at school, could be classmates, could be teammates, could be family members. And you suffer for Christ's sake from these sources and you are surprised, you're caught off guard. How could it have come from this kind of a place? And you become more aware. Maybe it tests the genuineness of your faith. Maybe it gives you a greater desire for the things of God. It shows us the weakness of our idols. They certainly don't come to our rescue. Or maybe simply the fragility of this life. When we're tested this way, we certainly pray more. We certainly read God's Word more. We certainly seek out advice from other Christians more. We certainly ask our leaders in the church to pray for us more and be with us more. Because we're being pressed. We're being persecuted. We're suffering for the sake of Christ. We're suffering simply because we're Christians. And we don't know what to do with that. But it refines us in these ways. We grow in these ways. It might be used for the conversion of those pressing the suffering upon you. That happens a lot, and it's happened a lot in church history. Think even of the centurion by the cross of Christ. Surely this man was the Son of God. He saw what they had done. He understood it. He had heard everything. And his assessment of that situation is we just put an innocent man to death. And everything that he said and claimed to be was actually true. And one of the reasons why he makes that confession is because right before him is all the evidence. Jesus was true. He went all the way. He went through death. Who does that if they don't really believe in the cause? And our suffering for Christ's sake might, either, might also strengthen other Christians. That's, that's the reason that Paul hoped for in his own situation. He's in prison, by the way, as he's writing this letter. I'm in chains. It's only a human irony that this prison letter could be the letter of joy that this letter that details a lot of Paul's suffering could be a letter of joy. Because he sees, Paul sees, in so many ways, and he wants this to be true for the Philippians and for us as well, that in his suffering for Christ's sake, they might be strengthened, that their faith might be increased, that their love might abound. And it might be the case that when you're suffering for Christ's sake, it actually strengthens another Christian in the same way. There are not too many things in this world anymore that lend credibility to different claims. So you get an advertisement that says this and this product or service is going to do these things for you. And then maybe it's got a celebrity endorsement or maybe it's got a bunch of stats or maybe it has some scientific information that's supposed to lend credibility to the claims that are being made. The word guarantee used to mean guarantee, and I think now generally most of us are skeptical of things that say guaranteed. And then you're thinking, well, okay, I know that that's going to fail. I just don't know when. But there's one thing in human history, and there are other things too, but this one for sure, that does lend credibility 
to the claims. When someone is willing to endure suffering for what he believes is true, that leaves a mark on people. Just like the centurion. Just like the witness of Jesus and Him dying. And just like Christians suffering for Christ's sake. When you are willing to endure suffering for what you believe, people don't ignore that. They can't ignore that. Because that shows a genuineness. That shows a commitment. That shows a loyalty. That shows that there is something of conviction empowering you to make those claims that you're even willing to suffer for it. There is something else about you that the eye does not see. And in your case, it's the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ working in you this new life. Because otherwise, not by your own sheer will would you be committed even to suffering. And I wouldn't either. We don't get up in the morning and, and talk ourselves into striving hard for the Lord today. Just by my sheer will and determination, I'm going to live for Jesus today. No, we get on our knees in confession. Father, my weakness May You overcome it by Your Spirit. So that by Your Spirit, I might live as a good citizen of the Gospel. Not my will, but Your will. And not by my will, but by Your will, let this be done. Overshadow all of my shortcomings with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Overcome my sinful heart in grace and in peace and in mercy. What might be the effect if we as Christians denied ourselves of our selfish desires, sacrificed for the good of others, loved each other despite the obvious flaws and shortcomings, and suffered together without criticizing each other's sufferings and sharing in the joy of bearing the cross. What a witness that would be. What a testimony to the world that would be. What a confession to people around you that that would be. And that's exactly what we're called to here. To be good citizens of the Gospel. To let the light shine to live in the grace and the peace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and what He's given to us. John 13.35 By this all people will know that you are My disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. Let's turn in the Trinity Psalter hymnal to number 409. Blessed be the tie that binds and let's stand to sing all the stanzas.
before we go to God in prayer, I did send out an email for another uh, prayer request for Don Cooper, that's Marlo and Darlene Fetter's daughter. She was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and will be meeting with a surgeon next week to determine uh, a course of action, a plan of action for her. So let's pray for Don and Kevin and their family and Marlo and Darlene as well in that situation. Let's go to God together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, our gracious God, we are so thankful to you for the life that we have in Jesus Christ. For us to have union with a perfect Savior could only come by your grace. And for us to worship you today or to give thanks for that precious gift could only be because your Holy Spirit is working in our hearts. He has brought that revival and reform and not by coercion or by force, but a spiritual enlivening, a spiritual life, and a new mind and a new heart that your Holy Spirit has put along with a new will to follow in your ways. May your Spirit continue to prevail in us that new obedience and that zeal for the worship and glory of you, our holy God. We thank You for the church. Without Your grace and without union in Christ in His ongoing work, how could we as different people all come together in one Spirit? How could we share together in this good news? How could we be citizens together or strive together for the faith? That too is of Your grace and a gift in the grace and mercy and peace of Jesus our Lord and Savior. May You continue to unite us in Him and strengthen the bonds of unity in the Spirit. Let our worship together and fellowship together be sweet. Let us strive together in fighting for the Gospel and standing firm in the Word of God. Forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. And whether we sin in any way against Your commandments, whether we sin against each other, or whether we forsake the communion of the saints, or whether we do not strive together as we ought to, or whether we do not manifest good citizenship of the Gospel. There are so many ways in which we fall short of Your glory. There are so many ways in which we desire to obey, but we give in to temptation. Forgive us, Father, for all of our sins. Forgive us for our hesitancy to obey. Forgive us for the excuses that we make. Forgive us of the sins of our hearts. And forgive us for the sins that we act upon. All for the sake of Jesus Christ. There's no other blood. And there's no other name. And there is no other way of salvation except through Your Son. So grant us faith that we may believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. And let Your Spirit work in us a newness, a new obedience, a desire, a thankfulness for this salvation. Father, we pray for Your mercies upon Your people and that You will help us and give us the gifts to share one another's burdens and sorrows and to build each other up. We pray, Father, for the Jacobsma family that You may comfort all of them and fill them with hope and with peace. We pray for Marv and Dolores, and especially their son Mardell and his cancer treatments. Be with Bert and Bev. We thank You, Father, that the bowling alley was reopened, but we pray that You may increase business and traffic. And we also pray that You be with Bert to recover well from his surgery. Be with Emmett and John and Crystal and Amelia and Clayton, giving them everything they need every day. Be near to Evan Harsman and work in him. Be with Celia to Naples, Vern's sister, and bless her through cancer treatments. We pray for Arlen Kachi that you be with him in his cancer treatments and watch over his health concerns. And we pray for Don and Kevin Cooper. We pray for Don that you will strengthen her and help her as she goes through breast cancer and dealing with it. We pray for wisdom and help 
and good advice at her visit with the surgeon next week. And we pray that you'd be with Marlo and Darlene and uplift and comfort them through all of this as well. Be with Dolores. Be with Andy and Betty. Be with Arlene. Be with Edna. Be near to Sonny and Thelma. Be near to Harriet and to Ella. And others, Father, who are unable to get around. Be with those who are unable to come to church. We pray, Father, that you will bless your people with your presence. And through your word and spirit, comfort them, giving us always a wonderful hope and a great joy in life. Be with all of our widows. Comfort them with the hope of the resurrection. Comfort them with your perfect peace. Comfort them with your perfect presence. They are loved by you. And may that love be poured out. May your favor be poured upon them. We pray for Scott and Cheryl. And we look forward to welcoming them into membership next Sunday. We are thankful for their desire to join us here. We pray bless them through your word and spirit. Bless them in fellowship in this church. Bless them through the gifts of the members. And may you indeed bless all of us through their gifts and their willingness and readiness to use those gifts as we strive together for the gospel, as we work together as citizens of the gospel. And Father, we pray that you will provide men in this church to lead as office bearers, as elders and deacons, and be with the council as they make nominations together. And we pray that you will provide and prepare those men for leadership in this church, for the well-being of this church, and to serve in office in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful blessings of being members of the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful blessing of being part of that body. You've made us all different, and you use us all differently. But we share in that one spirit and peace, and we rejoice in that, that your love and grace have come upon us in so many wonderful ways. May you be praised in everything. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our offerings again would be for the general fund and for Christian education. So if you haven't already on your way in, please deposit those on your way out. The offering bags are listed there or there in the back on your way out. So let's stand together to sing our doxology number 121. Stanza one, O God to us, show mercy. Lift up your hearts and receive God's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.